Okay, I'm sorry for the delay. Good evening, everyone. Let's gonna, we're uh, reconvening our open session, and I'd like to ask our clerk to report out actions taken in closed <clears throat> session. On a seven to zero vote, the board took action in closed session to accept the resignation of a probationary faculty member and to approve the separation agreement and general release as executed by the probationary faculty member and the district and the author authorized the chancellor de or designee to take all steps necessary to affect the decision. All right, thank you for that, Trustee Inman, and back to you for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Trustee Jay. A few days ago, whoops. A few days ago, my 11-year-old granddaughter, Shannon, told me that the kids in the fifth grade were doing reports for Black History Month and that hers was on Jackie Robinson. This led us to a discussion about Arthur Ashe and how both went to my alma mater, UCLA. I shared with her that one of the highlights of my time there was when Martin Luther King spoke at UCLA. He didn't play baseball or Dennis, but rather used profound thoughts and words to help people. In his 1964 Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech in Oslo, Norway, he stated, I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education, and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. Unfortunately, this isn't happening in today's war-torn world. We have hate to thank for that. MLK had a lot to say about that as well. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Let us pray for love, not hate, and peace, not war. The country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you for that. We now have several requests for public comment. I'd like to just remind those who are going to make public comments that we do constrain the comments to two minutes that will be enforced. Um, so I ask that you be mindful of that. The first person that uh, is up for uh, make public comment is Benjamin Lebedin, Lebedine. Did I say that right? And then next up is Crystal C Cazares. Whenever you begin your two minutes, we'll start. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ben Lebedin, and I am the Vice President of the Saddleback Veterans Club. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the board for their continued support of veterans at Saddleback College and highlight a recent trip the club was able to make. Due to your generous support of the Saddleback College Vets Program, eight members of the Saddleback Veterans Club and its two advisors were able to attend the 2024 Student Veterans of America National Conference. This event was held from 3 to 7 January in Nashville, Tennessee. The National Conference of the SVA is the largest gathering of student veterans anywhere in the world and serves as a focal point in the academic year to share ideas and best practices, as well as network with student veterans, their families, supporters, and allies. The opportunities were endless, but some of the highlights of the trip included a government affairs session featuring distinguished speakers from the Secretary of Veterans Affairs and the Assistant Secretary for the U.S. Department of Education. There was also a three-day campus networking event where we were able to meet with admissions officers from top-tier universities as we prepared to transfer. Industry leaders and recruiters of corporations such as Boeing, Disney, and AT&T were also present, as well as organizations for continued development like Warrior Scholar Project and Hiring Our Heroes. The members of our club were able to make relationship for the, relationships for the future 
and even resulted in one of our members being offered an internship. Numerous breakout sessions were attended by club members on topics ranging from opportunities in education and business, VA healthcare and benefits, mental health, and various seminars in personal and professional development. The members of the club and advisors were able to gather information and knowledge that not only greatly benefited themselves, but more importantly, we've been able to bring back to the Saddleback College and share with fellow students, resulting in exponential campus growth. Once again, we cannot thank you enough for your support, and we wish to continue our relationship with the board in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Crystal Cazares, a Saddleback alumni, graduated here um, in 2010. I'm here today to tell you about Partners of Algebra. Thanks to my mentors in this organization, I graduated from UCLA, and today I'm working for the California Air Resources Board. Uh, my siblings, Denise, uh, who also graduated from USD, and my brother from UCSB, um, all three first-generation um, ment were mentees in this program. Partners in Algebra is a nonprofit organization that was formed 20 years ago to assist underrepresented first-generation Saddleback students with their math skills, like myself. Since math is typically the subject that will most likely prevent a student from completing an AA degree or transferring, this was, our, um, this was their first focus. Over the years, they have added other subject areas providing mentors in, levels, in all levels of biology, chemistry, accounting, physics, business, English, art, Spanish, sociology, and, um, and more. To date, Partners in Algebra has been very successful in um, transfer, and allowing for students to transfer to UC campuses, NYU, Columbia University, USC, USD, Chapman, as well as um, the Cal State system. We're very proud that two of the new mentors in the program are recent UCLA and USD graduates who themselves participated in the program as students. The effort of all the mentors in the program is making profound difference, not only in the lives of the students, but also in the lives that th um, they also touch. Every student that success will have an effect that ripples through the, their community. As a token of our appreciation, several mentors come, come for Spanish conversations at the mentor's house. Doctors who want to better serve the Latin community, physical therapists that would like to better serve their patients, dentists, lawyers, to be able to understand their Spanish-speaking speak, uh, clients along with sociologists, psychologists, you, I'm nurses, sorry, can, can you wrap things up? Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, next up is Carmen Mara Hernandez and then Bridget Sanchez. Bridget Sanchez couldn't be here today. She is training for a, for a new job. So she sent me her statement, and um, he allowed me to read her statement. Thank you, Jamal. My name is Bridget Sanchez Hernandez, a Sarva College alumni. My brother Alex and myself were mentees in partners in algebra. Alex graduated from Fullerton, and now he continues his education in Cal State. Uh, after Sarabac, I graduated from USD with a degree in business. It took many, many years and many, many mentors for my journey to USD. And right now, I'm currently finished my MBA at UCI. I am going to graduate in June. Thank you to all my mentors. I was very excited when I heard that now Sarabac College is a Hispanic-serving institution. But now, I am in this belief that my alma mater, Sarva College, is not approving partners in algebra nonprofit. Many in our Latin community have been successful and graduated from four year institutions and continue with master degrees. Thanks to the many mentors, each one of whom has relied to complete our education. My man, Marisol Sanchez, as Professor Hernandez Bravo called her, is a root leader in the Latin community. She didn't attend college in her mother country, and her limited English knowledge is always in the community talking about the importance of education. She has taken several families to the Karimi houses on Sunday, 
asking for help to different parents, filling out application, and to, for us to understand the educational system and for mentorship for our sons and daughters. We have maintained contact with some of them. The Garcia family, Amy graduated from Fullerton College, Kim graduated from USC, Karen from Fullerton College, and I can name many, many more families who have taken advantage okay, Carmen of the Sunday evening. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Carmen Mara Hernandez Bravo. I <laughs> would like to thank the two financial donors to this program, our former international language dean, Kevin O'Connor, for his yearly scholarship of $500, to provide books for the students, and to the Karimi family for decades of giving a scholarship for high school, transferring to four-year institution, and for the students participating in the Education Abroad program. I would like to thank all the mentors in this uh, organization. First, South Orange County trustee, Marcia Michiker. Thank you so much, Marcia. You are mentee, Elizabeth Lua, Tra uh, transferred and graduated from Columbia University. Now she's presently teaching in Washington. Professor David Bouguet, your mentee Bridget is graduating this spring with an MBA from UCI. Thank you for all the resume you have help the students from this partners in algebra, also for teaching them how to interview, to transfer to graduate school, and also to job in the two. Professor Shia, Professor Carla Huefa. You are a student, Isabel Gutierrez, graduated from UCI. Professor Amina Yacine, Professor Abima Muna. Your mentee is now a counselor in the community college in the San Diego district. Professor Beatriz Garcia, Professor Silvia Vasquez, Professor Majid Karimi, <laughs> Your mentee Denise graduated from USD. Professor Peter Morey, your mentee Jasmine Cruz graduated from USC with a master degree in accounting. Saman, your mentee Federico Rolandi graduated from UCI and he is presently practicing psychology. To all the English professors that they have read so many essays, Kevin O'Connor, Carmen, Carmen Mara, you told Thank me you. you would comply. I Thank okay. You. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you for those comments. We're now on to board reports. And uh, why don't I start with Trustee Melchiker? Okay. You good with that? Yeah, All right. fine. Um, the Rising Scholar event that was launched at IBC was chaired by Professor um, Aaron Pollard. And IBC and Saddleback now assist formerly incarcerated youth to create opportunities for successful futures for these young people. The Rising Scholar students included a well-known rapper, and these Rising Scholar students performed and interacted with, with all of us in, in attendance. The librarian, Brandy Eidelman, chaired the second IBC uh, Second Guided Pathway Success Fair, with, with, along with College Compliance Officer Marco Kamal, at my side, we once again enrolled about maybe 500 students. Professor Eidelman relied on the assistance of the marketing specialist, Anthony Erco Lamento, for the smashing success of the event, which guided students through pathways to complete their learning goals and gets much needed support. Trustee Inman and I were appointed to a federal ACCT committee, and our district personally met with um, Congressman Mike Levin, Congresswoman Young, Young Kim, Congresswoman Katie Porter's staff, the Department of Labor, the Department of Education, con and Congressman Levin agreed to carry our tax-free Pell Grant Act for us. This would alleviate a, bur a burden on our low-income students and has bipartisan support. Chancellor Barnes and Letitia um, accompanied us and helped us in these most successful meetings. Professor Marianne Wolf cra crafted the Elevate APPI Lunar New Year of the Dragon event at IPC. And President Hernandez welcomed these students to, to IVC and men, mentioned that we are so delighted to have such a wonderfully diverse student body working together in peace and harmony. And I couldn't agree more. We'd enjoy dancers, musicians, a sword dance, 
and the IBC Emeritus Tai Chi class demonstration that I volunteered to participate in, and that was a great exercise and a great fun. I also attended the Ledge Task Force meeting and the Mars Rover meetings, and thanks, Carmen Meyer, for mentioning me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that, Trustee Milchiker. Trustee Jay. I have no report. Wow, that's, that's good. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, Trustee Rydell. Good evening, everyone. I do have something to report, two areas. Um, I'd like to dovetail what uh, Trustee Melchiker said about mm -hmm. the Rising Scholars. <clears throat> Excuse me. It, I've been here a long time, and it probably is the most uh, touching thing. When I say touching, it was an arrow that just speared my being, meaning that the students that came from this group were absolutely outstanding, and a long time ago, uh, some of you know I'd like to do things, and I often thought, why doesn't Saddleback go into the jails and, and teach, et cetera? Well, they're coming to us at Saddleback and at IVC, and I applaud our presidents for supporting this. Um, you have to be over the age of 25 that, and currently enrolled in the classes at IVC for the Rising Scholars, which I thought was important. Um, the reentry of these scholars face unique challenges. You can all appreciate that. Um, when that arrow hit me, what I saw was someone in jail writing the playwright that I heard, and about seven people, and I thought, oh my goodness, seven people, but there could have been 14. I would have listened intently to all of them. What they did is they acted out the screenplay um, or the playwright of the people that are currently in jail who hopefully will come and take their spot on stage someday. And I'm hoping that our colleges will give us uh, feedback every year during professional development because I think the audience can be duplicated and it just, I hope all of you will attend when you hear this in professional development. I also would like to quickly, ooh, I got 25 seconds. Um, I belong on the foundation board as a representative and I just wanna tell you the foundation board at Saddleback is doing fantastic. Their donations have increased and what I like, what I heard was the increase in faculty and staff who now contribute, and I think that's so important that we all contribute to our students financially. They raised over almost 300% more than they had before. The table of 10 is coming up this Sunday, and hopefully they will double their, their donations from last year. And okay, I got one more thing to say. Um, someone donated a $50,000 charitable partnership to the foundation to, uh, for us to be involved in a what is it? Saddleback College Foundation Flag Football Tournament. And it was selected by the NFL football players who may even participate. Okay. Thank you. Sorry Thank to be you. over. Trustee Inman. I ditto everything Trustee Rydell said about the Rising Scholars. When I was president of the Community College Association, I attended two commencements at Palo Verde Community College. The unique thing about these celebrations was that they were both inside the prison, one Chuckawalla State Prison and the other one Ironwood State Prison. And yes, I heard the clang of the gate and we were locked in. These were two of the most important days of my term as I saw more than any other time the incredible difference that education can make in a person's life. So I'm very, very excited about the Rising Scholar Program. The event to Washington, D.C. Was, was useful and interesting. Um, I attended the Public Policy and Advocacy Committee meeting, which is the one that I'm on, and a special leadership training the next day. And they taught us a few new things about how to advocate. That helped when we met uh, the different people that Trustee Milchiker has already stated. One of my requests had to do with student veterans, and it was very well received by both of the um, Congress people, or yeah, that we saw. We also requested them to co-sponsor eliminating taxation on Pell Grants, and two days later we found out that Con Congressman Levin had done just that. So two very important things happening this, this month. Thank you. Thank you for that. Trustee Prendergast. I uh, just will use this my annual opportunity to say gung hoon fwa choi, xin yin kwai lo, and chuk mong nam moi. No report. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that. Trustee Deck. Uh, so my only report this month is that I was happy to support our chancellor 
this month being installed once again onto the Orange County Business Council's Board of Directors at their annual dinner on February 15th. Our chancellor's doing a great job on there and uh, happy to show my support. Uh, other than that, that's it. Thank you for that. I'll just mention, I prospectively, I was actually traveling quite a bit this past month, went to see my daughter in Armenia, uh, and so that was fantastic to see her. Um, and I was actually in D.C. as well, and I saw our uh, members of Congress, so that was good. Uh, prospectively, we have two really big things this week I'm excited about. We've got the groundbreaking for the Gateway Building, I believe, on Wednesday, and then the first ever State of the District on Friday. Mm -hmm. And this is a pretty significant milestone. Some of you who are see what's going on in the cities and counties, they make this a big deal. A lot of the cities do it with their chambers of commerce. Some do it independently. The county does a big event. Um, so for us, the State of the District this Friday, if you aren't registered to come, you should. Um, it's very exciting. I know that the chancellor, her team, and the two colleges and have put in a lot of effort, and uh, I'm really, really looking forward to it. So thank you for all the work you've done um, to make it happen. And with that, I'll turn over to student trustee Hitty. Right. Good evening. This past month, I had the pleasure of attending President Stern's Pizza with the President, educational Q&A hosted by Saddleback ASG's Campus Life Committee. There was a substantial turnout, and President Stern addressed a wide range of student concerns and questions. He did an excellent job working towards bridging the gap between students and faculty, and I believe that the event was truly successful in helping students feel more seen by our college staff. Both Saddleback and IVC are continuing preparation towards their conference in D.C. coming up in March. Students on both campuses are working towards advocating for legislation that supports student success and acknowledges the importance of our commu California community colleges. We are wishing them the best of luck, and I look forward to hearing more about their experiences. To promote civic engagement across our student body at large, Saddleback ASU will be also holding a Paninis in Politics panel and discussion tomorrow at 1.30 to discuss how to have productive political conversations. The event will host a panel of experts to assist our students to become respectful and involved advocates and leaders. I'm also looking forward to attending the Gateway Building, Ribbon Cutting, and the Grand Opening on Wednesday and the State of, Address State of District Address this Friday. Thank you. Thank you, you just, and you just triggered me that if you don't know by now, there is an election. Um, so it does conclude next Tuesday. So if you have not had a chance or have not been able to vote yet, uh, please do so. There are voting centers across the county. Uh, everyone in the state now receives a mail-in ballot. And of course, you can do, still go on election day to your precinct. Um, so with that, I'll ask, um, we're on to ASG, ASG Saddleback College. Hello? Okay, awesome. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, this is my office report. So we are uh, going underway with our own ASG elections uh, happening in March 11th through 14th. Multiple candidates have filed in, so it should be very lively. Um, Caitlin kind of stole my, what I was going to say, but we are going to having our DC uh, advocacy is underway with our group selected. We'll be coming together to have a strategy going into the conference. Uh, we also hosted Pizza with the President event, uh, led by our Senator for Campus Life, Holly Berrigan, which was really successful. Props to her. Uh, we also have our Paninis and Politics coming up uh, with presence um, with, to talk about um, uh, to be more civil in, in political engagements, um, led by Michael. We also uh, worked with uh, IBC to come to a common ground solution involving the student stamp fees. Um, uh, we will be continuing to work with President Stern to continue our menstrual equity initiative um, to have menstrual dispensers in our restrooms. Um, some of our members in ASG have been working to improve some counseling inconsistencies, but overall it's been very successful. And we are, wor uh, we are working on, on participating in our campus's senior day to try and recruit incoming students from high school to also join our ASG. And that is the end of my report. Excellent. All right. Saddleback College. I mean, Irvine Valley College, sorry. I just, thank you for that Saddleback College. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you all again. Uh, today, especially out of all days, I was reminded that after tonight, I only have three more board reports with you all. So it's a pleasure to see you. 
Um, and <laughs> that's uh, that's because today was the start of our elections and campaigning. And so we had over 50 candidates for all of our positions. And 50? F- over 50, yes, that's for for all of our different that's positions. Amazing. Our entire board is open, as well as uh, the student trustee position at IVC. And so, yes, there's only um, March, April, and May left for my reports with you all. But uh, also, rep- retrospectively, February 7th, we had a club day, and we had over 50 student organizations. Uh, we were planning to have this indoors, but luckily we did have it outside because the weather was cooperating with us. We are also preparing uh, is it, to uh, go to our student government adequacy trip. Uh, our student government advisor, Dr. Eric Joe Hall, uh, connected us with Council Teacher Clark um, to prepare us for this trip along with the Townsend Public Affairs to make sure that we have a great trip. And while I have some time left, I want to thank a moment to to thank a couple people and one in particular. Um, IVC has a tradition of uh, in shared governance meetings having caring campus moments. And I do want to give one that's helped me a lot in my journey, you know, outside of countless people that I could thank and especially God. But uh, this past semester in December was the application deadline for the Phi Theta Kappa All USA Academic Team. And I irresponsibly waited until almost the last minute to do so. And I needed a letter of recommendation. And it was the last day to submit on a Friday. And our assistant, uh, uh, Dean of Student Services uh, and, doc- and Student Government Advisor, Dr. Emmick Hall wrote that letter for me. And uh, if it wasn't for him, I would not have submitted that letter. And it was thanks to him uh, really caring and supporting me throughout my entire journey in student government, uh, inside and outside of the classroom, being a great mentor. Um, I was selected for the All-USA Academic Team. So I'm one of uh, 20 students out of over 2,200 applicants in the country. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. I know I'm a little over time, but but want to take this moment to thank everyone that supported me through this, and especially uh, Dr. Eric Joe Hall, who we need more people like him in education to support students like me who are who are searching for something bigger in life. Thank you. All right, Diego. Thanks for that report. Moving on to the IVC Academic Senate, Rebecca Beck. Good evening. Good to see all of you. First, I'm thrilled to report that we, in my humble opinion, are well prepared for our accreditation visit tomorrow. And this milestone is not just a testament to our commitment to do best for our students, but also reflects the extraordinary dedication and leadership of two of our faculty colleagues. I would like to give a shout out to my two colleagues, Keith Donovan and Thomas Collin, who co-chair the Student Learning Outcomes Task Force. There are tireless efforts in tiering us, our faculty, towards student learning outcomes have been nothing short of outstanding. Keith and Thomas have gone above and beyond diving deep <clears throat> into data analysis with the unwavering support of our Director of Research, Loris Fagioli, and engaging with faculty across our departments to ensure that our outcomes are met. Their hard work and dedication have brought us to this point, and I believe it's only fitting to extend our deepest gratitude and recognition to their contributions. Moving forward, I'm equally excited to share that the Professional Learning Task Force task force, excuse me, has officially begun its meetings. This dynamic group comprising of faculty, administrators, classified professionals, and most importantly, students, embodies the collaborative spirit that drives our work at our college. Together, they are crafting a visionary plan for our IEPI grant, which is on our agenda tonight. The progress that we've seen so far is encouraging signaling not only a well-aligned team, but also a shared commitment to enhancing professional learning across our campus. The work of the task force is crucial in laying down a roadmap that will guide us in harnessing the full potential of this grant, ultimately enriching our learning environment and ensuring our student, excuse me, our institution continues to thrive. In closing, I would like to express my profound appreciation again for our colleagues as they prepare us for our visit tomorrow and for all the hard work and dedication from all of you. It is through our collective efforts that we continue to make a meaningful impact in the lives of our students. And thank you for always supporting our mission. Thank you. And we had a uh, board officers had a positive visit with the accreditation team a couple hours ago. All right. uh, uh, Saddleback College Academic Senate, Margot Lovett. So you're not going to be quite as happy with me as you were with Trustee Jay, oh, no. but you're going to but you're going to be very happy with me <laughs> because all I would like to say is that both IVC and Saddleback's academic senates are looking forward to participating in the Chancellor's State of the District event on Friday, 
And at that time, we will update you on collaboration between the two Senates and between the Senate's college administration and the district. So I will hold my comments until then. Thank you. Oh, that was good. That was short. <laughs> and so, yeah, that was good. OK. All right. Uh, oh, Faculty Association, Melanie Hayeri. Well, I'm not going to promise that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not known for being short on words, <clears throat> but I'll try. Um, tonight, I just want to honor two parts of our faculty, two distinct parts, but both worthy of mention. First, I'd like to a big shout out to all faculty who are moving forward um, through approval tonight in the tenure process. We have faculty moving forward to their second year, third year, fourth year. We have a fairly large group of faculty that are receiving their tenure tonight and just congratulations and thank you for going through the process, sticking with our district and doing all the work that you do for our faculty and our students and our colleges. Big shout out, congratulations. And after that, I want to talk about a group of amazing faculty who are leaving their career, opposite side of the story. We have three faculty retiring and I just want to shout out for them too. First is Stevie Daniels in ESL at Saddleback College. Yeah, that's totally. Um, the other two are from IVC, Julie Hanks um, in kinesiology. And Jerry Hernandez at IVC in kinesiology. And I, I worked a lot with, of those three, I worked with um, Jerry when I worked in my reading center. And he would make sure his students came. All those athletes would get to the reading lab. And so we had a great collaboration. And I have enjoyed working with him all these years. So congratulations and wishing them all the best in their next chapter. OK, so not that long, but not that short. That was great. Thank you. Moving on uh, to the IVC Classified Senate, Ace. <laughs> Kag 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 Kagiwa. Kagiwa. You yeah, there you go. There you go. Kagiwa. Correct. You said Gi? Okay. Before you're done with your tenure, I'm going to get it right. Don't worry. I still got a few more. Kagi well, I, Kagiwa. One, one more year and a few more months. All so right. good evening again, everyone. Um, so my first report is actually a correction from my last report from January. We're not doing the Caring Campus Blood Drive this February. We're actually, we've moved it to March 27. So we have a blood drive happening on campus on March 27 with our Caring Campus. Um, we're now also busy preparing for our Lunch and Learn series, which is on the best practices on how to plan events on campus. And we're actually quite anticipating a good number of classified professionals to participate. Uh, we currently have a tentative date of April 23. As we get close to Classified Day on March 17, which we are very excited about as a collaboration between the, the district and um, both colleges, um, there's also been a lot more collaborations happening between IVC and Saddleback Classified Senate that I would like to report on tonight. Uh, one of the th few things that we're um, planning, me and Chantel, um, we're working together on actually creating, a, um, um, sending a strong delegate of classified professionals to this year's um, Classified Leadership Institute um, conference in June um, that is hosted by our governing board, which is the 4CS. And lastly is that um, some previous conversations with Chantel that I'm, I'm, I'm personally very excited about for this coming year is talking about our joint summer retreat. We've already narrowed down some themes that we want to talk about for classified professionals, particularly focusing on engagement, professional development, and advocacy for classified professionals. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now moving on to Saddleback College, Chantel Gill. Good evening, trustees. Tonight I want to highlight the wonderful work that our Caring Campus team has been doing in support of our behavioral commitments at Saddleback College. Last Friday we held the first Saddleback Cares Roadshow, a peer-to-peer -peer training for classified professionals titled Directories Decoded. Our colleagues were invited to learn from Ni nee Sam, our colleague in IT, on the best ways to utilize the various directories and platforms in order to connect with colleagues across campus, and most importantly, to continue to provide accurate referrals for all of our students. This is the first of many roadshows to support classified professionals at Saddleback College, and we want to thank President Stern and all of the managers across campus that have been incredibly supportive of these roadshows and all of the hard work that goes behind making Saddleback a caring campus. Special thanks to the Saddleback Cares Chairs for leading this work, Leo Fallback, Elliot Kling, 
Stephanie Reyna, and Violetta Zahari for all their hard work in coordinating meaningful events for all of our classified colleagues. Thank you. Thank you for that. And to bring us home, CSEA President Scott Green. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, Board of Trustees. Um, as we come out of the Black History Month, um, we certainly appreciated all the contributions that African Americans have given to America. As we move into the month of March, it is the Music Education in Schools Month. CSCA statewide is going to be very much in support of it. They're a part of it. Um, music is uh, the universal language. I know for me, um, I was introduced to music very young um, in, when I was in elementary school, and it got me very interested in music that by the time I was 11, I was playing second clarinet in a classical orchestra in my home state of Pennsylvania. I'm also very grateful that music actually does run in my family. Um, my blood relatives include country singer Leanne Walmack, country vocalist Connie Britton from the TV show Nashville, Hall of Fame songwriter Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees, legendary blues singer Bessie Love, and I just found out very recently Elvis Presley. Wow. So <laughs> music does really connect no matter what race, no matter what nationality, no matter who you are. It is something that can be global. And I'm looking forward to next month to even find out more about the history of music all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. That's an amazing lineage. All right. I don't think we have any, uh, some, anyone here from POA or, okay. Any requests for board reports? No? Uh, one, before we move on to public hearings, I just wanted to make an announcement that uh, on March 8th, on Friday, the Irvine Valley Count Foundation will be having its uh, dinner, its fundraising dinner. It'll be at the Marconi Automotive Museum. That's Friday evening, March 8th. Um, there is a chance I will be in Washington, D.C. and will not make it. I, I'm going to try to be here, but I just wanted to let you know that, Dr. Hernandez. But um, this is a great event. It's so important. So if you're able to attend on Friday evening, March 8th, at Marconi, the IBC Foundation Dinner, please do so. Now we're on to uh, item 5.1. So we're now at board agenda item 5.1 regarding a public hearing on the South Orange County Community College District, California School Employees Association, Chapter 586's initial proposal to the district. Before we hold the public hearing, Vice Chancellor Cindy Viscachill will provide an introduction. Thank you. The board will conduct a public hearing to provide an opportunity for the public to comment on the California School Employees Association's initial proposal to the district. If the board has any questions throughout the public hearing process, I'm here to assist. Does the board have any questions for staff to assist with their understanding of this matter? Board item 5.1, the public hearing on the matter at hand is now open. Public comments are not to exceed two minutes. No public comments requested. Okay, the public hearing is now closed. Is there any further discussion on this matter by the Board of Trustees? Public, uh, I'm sorry, item 5.1 is now concluded. We'll now move on to 5.2, adoption of the South Orange County Community College District California School Employees Association initial proposal to the district. I'd like to call for a motion and a second. So move. Motion from Trustee Milchiker. Second. A second from Trustee Prendergast. I don't think we have any questions, so I think we can go ahead and vote. The motion carries on a unanimous trustee yes vote and a student trustee yes vote. We're now on to resolutions. We have one resolution. <coughs> And I'd like to ask our clerk to report out uh, the resolution. There's one resolution on the agenda this month for approval. The resolution we are approving tonight refers to item 6.1, recognizing the cultural and historical significance of Lunar New Year in 2024. Whereas the Lunar New Year begins on the second new moon following the winter solstice or the first day of the new year, according to the lunar solar calendar, and extends until the full moon 15 days later, and be it resolved 
that in observation of this Lunar New Year, the Year of the Dragon, the SOCCCD expresses its deepest respect for Asian Americans and all individuals throughout the world who celebrate this significant occasion and wishes Asian Americans and all individuals who observe the holiday a happy and prosperous new year. May we have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, motion from Trustee Melchiker, and I, is that you, Trustee Jay? Yeah. Second from Trustee <laughs> Jay. Let's go ahead and vote on the resolution. The motion carries on a unanimous trustee yes vote and a student trustee yes vote. We're on to 7.1, trustees requests for attending conferences. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion from Trustee Jay. I second it. Second from Trustee Milchiker. Any questions? Okay, let's vote on the item. Motion carries on a unanimous trustee yes vote and a student advisory yes vote. 7.2, authorization of payment to trustee absent from board meeting. Um, I'll move, so moved. Motion from Trustee Milchiker. Second. second from Trustee Rydell. Let's go ahead and vote on the item. Uh, motion carries on a six to zero trustee yes vote, one abstention, and a student trustee yes vote. Item 7.3, the OCSBA Marion Bergeson Award. We have discussed this award many times in the past, and we have one of our trustees who's a past recipient, recipient Trustee Milchiker. Um, do we have any potential nominations for this award? I have one. Trustee... Inman. I would like to nominate Trustee Pendergast. Okay. Am I eligible? Mm -hmm. You're representative for that group. I mean, I'll take it, but I can't. <laughs> you are eligible. I thought that there was a... a Eligibility criteria. You just have to be a school board or college board member. Is that what are the what's the criteria, Trustee Melchior? Current college or school board member. That's, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. And I think and you've served one year. I think you have to have served one year. Yeah, I read it. I think. Okay, and it just I should I guess open up the item. Uh, what's the the deadline is two days. <laughs> oh no, four days. It, it was actually on Friday. However, oh. what, what happened is they released the application after the last board meeting. So the first time we get it on the, on the docket was today. So they gave us an extension one day. So I was right. <laughs> so it's due tomorrow? Due tomorrow, <laughs> two pages. You're going to help me that, right, Leticia? <laughs> <laughs> Are we still moving ahead with one day deadline? Okay. So we need a second? Uh, second. Okay, second from Trustee Milchiker. So I have a motion from Trustee Inman and second from Trustee Milchiker to nominate Trustee Prendergast for the Marion Bergeson Award uh, as part of the Orange County School Board Association. Okay, the motion carries, the nomination carries on a six to zero trustee yes vote, one abstention, and a two student, student advisory yes vote. Congratulations on the nomination and good luck. Next is 7.4, the OCSBA Maureen DeMarco Award nomination. That could be for Did anybody. you also win that? No, I never won that. <laughs> that. That could be for anybody, a school board member or not a school board member. So Just what's the service. difference in the criteria between the two awards? That, that has um, serviced the needs of young people, demonstrated countywide service in addressing the needs of young people. That's the DeMarco Award. That's a, that's a DeMarco Award. Okay. No, it doesn't. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. We did nominate someone. I don't remember. Well, do we have a nomination? No? Going once. All right, so it looks like we're not going to have a nomination for the Maureen DeMarco Award. Now... We'll move on to our one of our three presentations. I assume we're going in order, so we'll start with the 8.1 Student Equity Plan presentation. Great. And while we are getting the presenters up to the podium, I'll just say a few uh, 
introductory remarks. I know one of the things that really drew me to our district and colleges was the strong value that our constituents had on DEIA, and for, for good reason. Um, kind of operationally, the, the, one of the, the, the operational reasons to do it, uh, one, uh, our new state chancellor's vision 2030 has a distinct focus on equity and closing equity gaps, so we are called upon to do so um, from a state perspective. Additionally, from a fiscal perspective, the student-centered funding formula also incentivizes uh, student success and equity metrics, and so it also um, uh, you know, incentivizes us to, to do so. But the real reason why we do it, obviously, is for our students. We have a diverse student body. We know when we're looking at the various uh, success metrics, the various momentum points, not all of our students are making it uh, through to the finish line. And so we, see, we continue to see equity gaps, but we also continue to see closing of our equity gaps. But in the, in the spirit of continuous improvement, um, we are uh, very intentional and proactive in employing uh, new efforts to be sure that we continue to close those gaps. Not only is it good for our students, and their families and the generations that come after them, but it's also good for our community because then our students are leaving here skilled and educated and then contributing um, to our community. So it's, it's good for everyone. So with that in mind, I am happy to introduce our college directors of college equity, inclusion and access from IVC, Aaron Pollard, and from uh, Saddleback College, Dr. Susana Castellanos. So welcome and we are eager to hear your report. Thank you. Good evening, as, as uh, our chancellor just mentioned. My name is Susana Castellanos, Director of College Equity and Inclusion and Access at Saddleback College. And I'm here with my wonderful colleague, Erin. And I'm Erin Pollard, also Director of College Equity, Inclusion and Access from Irvine Valley College. So today we're here to speak <clears throat> briefly about uh, why we are focusing on student equity. Uh, thank you for that beautiful lead in, Chancellor Barnes. Uh, we're going to speak about the difference between equality and equity, a few equity metrics that the state asks us to measure, uh, those elements disaggregated. There are key ones that we need to focus on. Our student equity plan at Saddleback and then the student equity plan at Irvine Valley College. So a great segue to what our chancellor just mentioned. Over the years, equity has gained momentum across the state, acknowledging our changing student demographics and their diverse learning abilities has been a change agent for our colleges to refocus in the way that we deliver instruction and student services. The uh, student-centered funding formula is also evidence of the importance of equity as it has elements of equity and student success that directly correlate with our equity metrics in the student equity plan, specifically the transfer of completion of transfer level math and English, the completion of academic goals, and the transfer metric. And then the, our chancellor's office at the state level is also communicating the great importance by providing us with ongoing funding every year to address our equity plan. And our goal is to ensure that we are closing the equity gaps by increasing and providing support systems to increase our student success. In order for us to be successful in equity, we must know the difference between equality and equity. Um, acknowledging that our students are coming from or coming to our college with diverse experiences and with diverse learning abilities. It's important that we stay away from creating systems that are a one-size-fits-all for all students. As you can see in this visual, if we think of this bicycle as our support system, and then the individuals that you see here as our students, if we create support systems that are a one-size-fits-all, we are providing a disservice to many of our students. As you can see in the first visual for equality, you see a student on a wheelchair. That uh, means that if we provide them with the same programming or service without acknowledging their abilities, they may not even be able to access those services. And for other students, the support system may be too big or too small, it's not the right fit for their, for their particular needs. 
This is where the equity work comes in and it's important for us to acknowledge their differences and create their support systems by tweaking them and providing um, specific support systems that address specific needs for certain student populations. As you can see, the person that was not able to access the bicycle by just providing a modified tricycle, it will be able, they will be able to access those services. And by providing a slightly different size of programming for our students may be able to accommodate those that at first the bicycle was too big or too small. And this is where our equity work begins. We have to create systems where we acknowledge those differences and keep it on the forefront so that we can continue to create systems that support all students by um, pro providing programming that closes the equity gaps um, and uh, increases their equal opportunity to um, gain access to complete their academic goals and be successful. All right, so how do we determine which student groups are in the highest need? The state gives us five specific metrics to look at. The first is called successful enrollment. That's the number of students that enroll out of the total number of applicants. So when students start our applications, are they completing the entire process and enrolling at our campuses? Uh, next, persistence. That is the number of students in the primary term that return for their second term. So are they retaining? Are they staying with us once they start on our campuses? Completing transfer level math and English. So the number of students who complete their transfer level math and English within the first year. Are we setting up these students for success and providing them with all the supports that they need to effectively complete those courses within the first year? Completion the number of students that complete their academic goal, and transfer the number of students that transfer to four-year universities. Within these metrics, we're also asked to disaggregate these elements by race, ethnicity, gender, age, ability, socioeconomic status, and membership in certain special populations, uh, like former foster youth, for example. So by doing this, we're able to really hone in on what specific groups need additional or different supports than we have offered in the past to try to close those equity gaps so that students in every group are able to succeed at our campuses really effectively. So what are we doing at Saddleback? So we take those uh, data elements for each of the metrics and we analyze them to determine where our students are experiencing equity gaps. And for those students that are experiencing equity gaps, we, know, we um, acknowledge them as disproportionately impacted students. And at, a, at the state chancellor's office, we're required to submit an equity plan. We just submitted the 2022-2025 plan and will be renewed after that. And we were asked to focus on at least one disproportionately impacted group. And what Saddleback did, we focused on two. You can see here that we are focusing on Hispanic Latinx and our first generation college students. The reason that we focus on these two groups is because they are experiencing equity gaps across various metrics and they represent a large population uh, percentage population in our campus. Our Hispanic Latinx represents roughly around 30% and our first generation around 19% of our student population. So this visual shows you where our students are experiencing disproportionate impact or equity gaps. On the first row, you'll see across the five metrics that we must address in our student equity plan, the successful enrollment, persistence, completed transfer level math and English, completion and transfer. And on the first column, you'll see the two disproportionately impacted groups that we are focusing on. The check marks that you see are where our students are experiencing equity gaps. So for Hispanic Latinx, you'll see that our students are experiencing um, equity gaps across all metrics with the exception of persistence. And for first generation college students, they're also experiencing equity gaps across all metrics with the exception of successful enrollment. Now the color coding represents our progress in closing our equity gaps. Where you see green boxes, that means that we are close to closing the equity gap for those students. Where you see that it's yellow, that means we're making a substantial improvements and are working in the right direction towards closing those gaps. And the red boxes show that we, have, we still are um, seeing 
persistence in equity gaps, and we have a lot of work to do. So for our Hispanic Latinx uh, population, you'll see that we are close to closing the gaps for successful enrollment, completed transfer level math and English. We are in the right direction towards completion, and we have uh, work to do in terms of transfer. And for our first generation college students, you'll see that we are close to closing the gaps for persistence, and we have work to do for completed transfer level math and English, completion and transfer. And this uh, visual shows you some of the initiatives that have been implemented at Saddleback to address these gaps. This is not a full list, but it highlights some of the efforts that are currently implemented on our campus. You'll see that for successful enrollment, we have enrollment coaches, we have enrollment workshops that are focused in providing orientation, advisement, and creating a first semester plan, and most importantly, bilingual. So we're offering those in Spanish for our Hispanic Latinx communities. Uh, we also have our, in our, each of our five schools a school dean, a counselor, and a coach to address the academic success barriers common to Hispanic Latinx students based on their area of study. And for persistence, we have peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, and we have established our basic needs center to address our non the non-academic barriers of our students. And for completed transfer math and English, Again, we have success coaches, family nights that are specific for Hispanic, Latinx, and first-generation college students and their families. And it's important to note that under this metric, AB705 has been integral and a key to eliminate the access gap into college-level English and math. For completion, we have student success workshops. And again, our teams uh, at each of the schools are utilizing school data dashboards to identify pathways to completion barriers. And if, lastly, for transfer, we have transfer center workshops, we have um, transfer focused counseling services, transfer fairs, and we have explored and adopted programming such as MESA, Puente, and Anapisi or ANPI. But our work is always ongoing. We do have um, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Committee, or the DEIA Committee. And that is chaired by a faculty member, a classified professional, and myself as the equity director. And our goals for this year is to review that plan that was submitted to the State Chancellor's Office and have a continual assessment process where we are assessing our programming, our services, to continue to improve the support system for our disproportionately impacted students. We are also supporting the resource allocation at Saddleback to ensure that any initiative that is equity focused is prioritized for our disproportionately impacted students. And through collaboration, we are also recommending professional development opportunities to the professional development committee. All right, and here's what it looks like at Irvine Valley College. So we have also selected the same groups, Hispanic, Latinx, and first-generation college students. Uh, we also made this choice because of the size of these groups on our campus. Our uh, Hispanic, Latinx students make up 21% of the student body, and our first-generation college students are 31% of our students. There's also a very high intersection between the two groups such that 41% of our first-gen college students are also identifying as Hispanic Latinx. So a lot of the efforts that we make for one group also have benefits in the other. So utilizing the same chart that you saw before, here's what IVC is looking at for our selected groups. For Hispanic Latinx, you can see that they are disproportionately impacted in each of the metrics. <clears throat> Excuse me. With, with our most concentrated efforts needed in transfer level English and math, completion and transfer, which is true for both groups. First generation college students are not disproportionately impacted in successful enrollment. Um, persistence for both groups we're doing pretty well in. We're getting very close to closing that gap, but it's clear from this that most of our efforts need to be concentrated in that completed transfer level math and English, completion and transfer. All right, the student equity initiatives. Uh, just as Susie said, this is not a complete list. I'm sorry for the teeny tiny writing. There is so much that our campuses are doing that have very specific 
efforts, um, highly intentioned on these specific groups. So uh, for successful enrollment, we have embedded targeted support programs with our outreach teams and our presentations. I'm just going to pick a few that are on here. Uh, persistence, we are front-loading students with fundamental college knowledge to help our first-gen students navigate higher education. These are things like, what is a bursar's office? What do I do at uh, my professor's office hour? What do I use that for? So that we can help our first-gen students navigate uh, this institution of higher education. Uh, we have lots of identity affirming events to bring the sense of belonging and the purpose to help with that persistence or retention. For transfer level English and math, we have communities of practice where our faculty are working together on things like equitable grading, norming, culturally responsive curriculum. Uh, we have an Elevate cohort program. Uh, I should note that Elevate is our Anapeasy program where 80% of those students are first generation students. For completion, well, we have an early support program for first-time probation students. This is on this slide because Hispanic and Latinx students are overrepresented in our probation student community. Uh, and transfer, we are scaling up our Puente program. We added math to the learning community. Uh, we have lots of transfer support, uh, support programs and many more. Next steps. So clearly we have work to do, which is okay. Uh, we have lots of initiatives and lots of processes built in to self-evaluate what we are doing to keep us nimble and responsive to the needs as they change. So for student equity plan review, we have accountability built into this uh, through the student success an equity council where we monitor and assess the progress of goals set forth in our student equity plan. Uh, we have equity-centered resource allocation. Uh, this is led by the Student Equity and Achievement Program, or SEEP committee. And we support the campus resource allocation process by rating these requests in order to ensure that initiatives are equity-focused and prioritize disproportionately impacted student communities, and specifically the ones we have mentioned here in our student equity plan. We also create and innovate equity initiatives. Many groups on campus work to develop new ideas, find successful programs at fellow colleges and universities, and collaborate with one another to create new programs and initiatives to permanently close these gaps for our students. IVC and Saddleback understand that equity work means changing ourselves as institutions to create greater success for our students, especially those who face the most barriers to success within our higher education institutions. This includes continued self-evaluation of our own procedures, our supports offered to students, and our understanding of what our students truly need to be successful in their academic goals. Both colleges are deeply committed to these values and ready to continue the work until student success is no longer predictable by Hispanic Latinx or first gen community membership. And thank you. Thank you for those presentations. Excellent job. Trustees, do you have any questions? I just Trustee Melchior. One quick question. Um, that was excellent. Thank you so much. W what is the Mesa Center and, and who is this for? The, the Mesa Center is Math, Engineering, and Science Achievement. So it's a STEM-focused center that is also focused on historically or contemporary underrepresented students in STEM fields. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Trustee Rydell. What are the number of students that we serve at IVC and here at Saddleback um, in this program? In these programs? Uh, since there were so many programs uh, mentioned there, I'm not sure how to quantify that. Um, I don't. I don't offhand know Mesa's numbers just because that one was specifically mentioned. I don't know if you have an idea of how to. Yeah, and for our colleges, is it, it varies. For some of these uh, initiatives, our goal is to make sure that we serve as many students as possible that are under our DI groups, and some of the initiatives serve as uh, targeted group. Um, we 
did present what we are doing for Hispanic Latinx and for first generation students, but we also need to understand that in our equity plan, we also have other disproportionately impacted students that may have smaller numbers. They represent smaller numbers, but we still need to um, provide programming for them. So to answer your question, the number of students will vary depending on what we are focusing on in terms of our DI groups and the programming directed towards them. I understand that, but we have no idea of, of about a number. I mean, we have X thousand of students on each campus. Do we serve half, a quarter? I mean, we have to have some idea, no? So to tell you... Um, how about, can I, can I help a, out with this? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so if we multiply the percentages you heard about times the number of students on each right. campus, Trustee Rydell, mm -hmm. uh, for Saddleback, it works out that we serve about eight to 9,000 Latino students on our campus Good. and about five to 6,000 first-generation students. Okay. Thanks for that. Christian. Trustee Edmund. I'm not sure I know how to ask, ask this correctly. But I'm very impressed with all of the ways that you are helping the students. I was very worried when, this is part I'm not sure about, but when um, remedial courses were discontinued, and I'd like to know if you feel that the things that are being done now have been an adequate replacement for those discontinued things. So AB 705 requires us to provide support with some of the courses. So it's not directly just taking away the basic skills courses, but is implementing uh, augmented support in the classroom for those that may have needed to take basic needs, so, uh, basic, basic skills courses. So there will be courses that come with support and some that don't come with that support. So those that will need it, that would traditionally take those basic skills courses will be, um, uh, recommended that they take those classes with a support system integrated in them. Yeah, and I'll just chime in. There's so much research and data and literature now that points to the fact that our developmental education reform efforts, not just in our colleges, but statewide, it's working. So, you know, the, the concept is that you remove some of the system barriers, and in our case, it would be the placement tests that have been deemed faulty and kind of misdirected students, perhaps disproportionately, to uh, remedial classes. But as, as was mentioned, there's embedded supports now in college-level classes to help support students. Thank you. So these courses then can be the classes that um, the UCs have told us that we shouldn't give credit to. And when you talk about a supportive class, I'm thinking uh, critical reading. Uh, critical thinking, those classes that our students transferred with. And now, well, if you encourage them, I hope they take them because there's no credit. Oh, no, these, these are, so what it is is that we're mandated to allow students to take college-level math and English. So I think some of the data that you presented is that we've seen um, exponential increases in students accessing college-level math and English, and those are uh, UC and CSU transferable courses. Okay, good. Trustee Prendergast. Yeah, so I just wanted to kind of touch on uh, Saddleback. You had made a lot of progress with the Hispanic, Hispanic Latinx, and that your one hole was the transfer. I'm just kind of curious, what's that hold up or what's that barrier? Because if you're if you're making so much progress, especially with the, the transfer level math and the transfer level English, and making such progress on the completion, the transfer you would think would kind of go. Is that more a hold up on the the four year end, or is it something that we are doing? It could be various things, and that's one of the goals of the DEIAC committee this year to look into what is working and what is not, and if there's gaps in programming that we are not considering to help the, uh, or particularly our Hispanic, Latinx, and, and first-generation college students in that area. Um, it may also be of... Um, something that we we are not know we don't know about so it's beneficial that we not only look at our equity plan but perhaps even consider student focus groups to determine 
what the barriers are within our system and, and find ways to remove them. Would it be helpful to also have a conversation with the four years that some of them are trying to get into and not? And perhaps even create e even more partnerships to create that pathway and make and streamline that for our students. Trustee Pettigrass, if I can add, uh, we just recently had a conversation with some leaders from UCI who came to our campus to talk about this very issue. How do we increase transfer to UCI? And ditto for Cal State Fullerton. I know that I was able to visit with the new um, president and her team, and then I think the president and the team also visited IBC recently, and we're all concerned about it. You're right. I think a lot of the barriers that we're seeing is acceptance rate at that level. One of the metrics that we're looking at internally here is transfer ready. So we know that we can get students transfer ready and increase numbers for transfer readiness, and then it's incumbent upon the four-year colleges to accept. But we're trying to work, or we are working with our four-year colleges to try to determine what more we can do together to address that. Any other questions? I just had one. So, are we uh, what, are we sharing our the data we have here statewide with other college districts, or are there best practices that are are is there some statewide group working group on DEI? Yes. Yes, we have the Region A group, and so all the colleges in the region we meet, we discuss best practices. We even invite our state chancellor's office, um, specifically for equity, to maintain and keep updated on anything that may come up from the state chancellor's office so that we are ready uh, to make adjustments if necessary. All right, very good. Thank you both. Next, we will hear a presentation on acute student homelessness. Great, and while they are walking up, I am going to just say a few words about this. So, uh, um, so obviously we all know that the pandemic really illuminated an existing issue that we already had among our students and others. Um, that is that a large number of our students are experiencing food and housing insecurities, um, which may interfere with their educational pursuits. And so um, as we are committed to removing barriers, both colleges have employed very robust efforts to address housing insecurities and acute uh, student homelessness. Um, as, as our, our trustees remember, we had a special study session that was very robust um, and rightfully so focused on student housing. And we were asked at that time to come back with more information on what we're doing to address uh, housing insecurities and, and acute student homelessness in the inter interim while we are seeking to um, possibly uh, build student housing on our campuses. So today it's going to focus on efforts on addressing um, housing insecurities and student uh, acute student homelessness. We will return again in April to talk more specifically about uh, the actual student housing, the, the, the capital project of student housing, so that will be April. So today we're going to talk about what we're doing and what more we can do in the interim while we're uh, looking at building student housing. So with that, I'll uh, introduce uh, Dr. Martha McDonald from IVC, our Vice President of Student Services, and she will introduce the team and the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Chancellor Barnes, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so yes, we would are, I have these wonderful colleagues of mine joining me today. Uh, first off, you've already met Dr. Susie Castellanos, who's a Director of Equity, Inclusion, and Access at Saddleback College. And I also have Liz McCann, Executive Director of Saddleback College Foundation, as well as Erin Pollard, Director of College Equity, Inclusion, and Access at Irwin Valley College. So we want to thank you for this opportunity to share what each of our colleges is doing um, to provide the support services that our students need in terms of uh, those students who are experiencing homelessness and home insecurity. Um, we also uh, want to share what we're doing currently to support those students and what we hope to do. So uh, for today's agenda, we plan to provide you with an overview of the problem, including why our students are experiencing homelessness and some of the factors that contribute, such as 
the cost of living, housing, the cost of housing, and as well as the financial aid limitations that we have. And uh, so next, we were going to share statistics and demographics on our students in need that pertain to our specific colleges, as well as uh, what we're doing to support their needs and what can be done right now. So with that, I'll turn it over to Liz. Thank you, Martha, and thank you all. Happy to be here tonight presenting on a topic that's near and dear to my heart. It actually inspired my dissertation topic. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the problem. So community college students are experiencing homelessness at staggering rates. Recent data that was collected by the Real College California study on basic needs shows that nearly 25% of community college students in California have experienced homelessness and approximately 60% are housing insecure. And a big contributor is, of course, the cost of housing in our region. An average one-bedroom apartment is nearly $2,800 a month and requires an annual salary of $85,000. Um, also, financial aid. Uh, the cost of attendance does not meet the true cost, and this can be a significant contributor. Um, so when we're talking about the cost of attendance, the these are the calculations that are used to determine a student's financial aid package. And I'm just gonna give you some specifics. So that 12 months of rent that we talked about is about 33, a little over $33,000 a year. Financial aid budgets, $22,000 a year for housing and food. So it's not just housing, it includes food. Um, another contributor to this issue is that federal funding has ended. Um, a lot of the federal funds that we've been using uh, to support students with basic needs are now gone. Um, and then our state funding is also quickly coming to a close. And moving forward, we'll really only support the bare bones of staffing our basic needs centers. And the last bullet point, our student housing timeline, uh, leads to the next slide. Um, which we've included here. This is really just a reminder. I know it's our proposed housing timeline, but we just wanted to give you a snapshot of what that looks like. So this is up for future discussion, I believe at the April board meeting. Um, and you, our trustees, are um, considering a, a housing plan for students. Um, so IVC student housing is proposed to begin construction in the 27-28 academic year. And so we know that'll likely take a couple years to complete um, with anticipated housing coming online for IV stu IVC students in the 29-30 academic year. At Saddleback, our student housing is proposed to begin construction in the 30-31 academic year and will likely not be open to students until at least the 32-33 academic year. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my wonderful colleague, Erin, who is going to talk to you a little bit more about specifics about our students in need at both IVC and Saddleback. Thank you. So here we have some survey data. Uh, in spring 2023, IVC participated in the Real College Survey administered by Research and Planning Group, the RP Group. The survey is the nation's largest assessment of student basic needs in, California, in the California Community College system. It had over 66,000 respondents. At IVC, that looked like 789 students participated, uh, which is about a 6% response rate. Uh, and students received an invitation to participate in an email, and it was anonymous. Uh, questions were adapted from a similar nationwide survey to include the California Community College specific questions about needs and services provided. Uh, and here in this metric, what you're looking at is 18% in the yellow bar. That is the percentage of students who experienced some form of housing insecurity in the last 12 months. And you've been hearing us use terms like housing insecurity or unhoused. Housing insecurity is someone who's experiencing something to uh, likely have them experience homelessness in the near future. It could be something uh, like... Uh, 
inability to pay for rent on a sustained basis or utilities or living with a family member and renting a room from them, but knowing that that is not going to be able to continue long term, any number of things could lead them into the category of uh, housing insecure. Uh, students who are unhoused include what you may think of as students who truly have no dwelling to be in. Uh, it includes students who are also in, uh, living in their vehicle. They are couch surfing, uh, too many families in one small apartment, um, or anything that is not a permanent stable housing for themselves. Uh, so on here, the uh, notated in the buildings, you see 45% of the students who experience housing insecurity are non-binary students and 42% are transgender students. I wanted to speak to those two points specifically. Uh, the reason that those, now these including Hispanic Latinx students and LGBTQ students are four of our largest disaggregated categories within that 18%, but also specifically they're of note here because our transgender and non-binary students are often not eligible for the same kind of resources when it comes to housing. Many of our temporary housing solutions are gender segregated. And when you call and ask if a student can be placed there, they will often inform me that their program is not set up uh, to take non-binary or trans students. Similarly, uh, home share options, renting a room from someone, these two communities can face dis uh, discrimination and it can be much harder to place them into secure housing. They're also part of communities that may uh, have their parents uh, may decide that they are no longer welcome in the home once they come out to their parents and suddenly find themselves unhoused. Uh, this is also not unique data. This can be seen across uh, the survey at large and lots of other surveys. It also highlights how individualized the housing support needs to be for our students. This is really not a one-size-fits-all model. And as we create the holistic, specifically tailored support for our students and create new plans going forward, it has to have that kind of lens of what is needed for the specific students based on their specific needs. Oh, and I should also note on this page, so 5% of students on this survey identified as actively homeless, uh, either currently or within the past 12 months, and 6% of students received housing assistance. Um, so the received housing assistance could have been from a community organization, it could have been from IVC. Uh, the way that this graphic is, it, it lumps those two responses together. And then Saddleback. So Saddleback did not participate in that particular survey uh, because it conducts its own student need survey each fall. The, the survey is a very important tool used to determine the heart of the problem while not overwhelming students with constant surveys. The survey was sent to all 19,000 credit earning students and had a response rate of 13%. So 375 student respondents, or 15% of the students uh, that responded to this survey, indicated that they were experiencing an unmet basic need, including housing insecurities. All students who indicated that they had a need uh, were contacted then by, the by Saddleback's CARE Corner team within two days. Additionally, of the students who indicated that they were experiencing an unmet basic need, 15% of those students, so 57 student respondents on this particular survey, um, also noted that they were experiencing housing insecurity or homelessness, which represents about 3% of the total respondents of this survey. All right, so here's a quick snapshot. What does this look like right now at IVC? <coughs> So part of, part of the difficulty with supporting students with their basic needs is we have to first know that they have basic needs that they need support with. They have to think to tell someone at their college, hey, I'm struggling with food, I'm struggling with housing, can, is there anything that can help me? And not all students even think to do that. So this snapshot right here is fall 2023 that just ended. At IVC, 68 students self-identified asked for help. They requested specifically housing support uh, from the basic needs program. So sometimes this came in as students directly requesting from our basic needs program. Sometimes it was a concerned faculty member who only found out when the student asked for an extension on their paper because they didn't have a place to live. 
Uh, sometimes it came through our foundation with a request for an emergency grant and mentioned specifically that this was for a housing need. So I can only assume the need is much higher, but these are the students who self-identified. At Saddleback, in fall 2023, 57 students were identified. Theirs was primarily through that survey that they did, um, and all students who then responded to that were contacted. And now I'd like to hand it off to Susie. Thank you, Erin. So to continue with the data that Erin just shared, that was just for fall 23. However, we have been supporting our students for longer periods than that. For the 2022-23 academic year, you'll see that 71 unique students at IVC self-reported that they needed housing support, while at Saddleback we had 102 unique students. And in order for us to understand this uh, student population that needs this support, we disaggregated them by gender, ethnicity, age group, enrollment intensity, and financial aid. And you'll see that there are some similarities and there are some differences. So if we focus just on the ethnicity, that's where the differences are. You'll see that for IVC, most of the students that need um, housing support identify as Asian, followed by Hispanic Latinx, and followed by white students. And for Saddleback, most of them identify as white, followed by Hispanic Latinx, and then followed by Black or African American. And now the similarities across the other metrics, we will see that most of them identify as female, followed by males. And then in speaking with what Aaron was saying, for those that have even more barriers to to, to face are those that decline or are non-binary, you'll see a significant number for IVC as well as Saddleback. Most of them are between the ages of 18 and 29. Most of them are enrolled as full-time students at each of our campuses. And 65% of them are receiving financial aid at IVC and 70% are receiving financial aid at Saddleback. Now it's important to note that the cost of living set by financial aid does not meet the, two, the true cost of attendance and the high cost of housing in our surrounding area. So even though they are receiving financial aid, it's not enough to support their housing costs. Now to help address some of the gaps in terms of cost, our campuses are implementing a number of resources for our students. Both of our campuses are offering emergency housing support. IVC provides short-term hotel vouchers, while Saddleback provides Airbnb vouchers. Both of, of the campuses offer emergency grants to address immediate housing needs and basic needs. And uh, the students that require this type of support also require a lot of care and attention. So we do provide personal appointments to provide each of our students with connections to resources both on campus and with our campus uh, community organizations off campus. And um, in terms of our on-campus resources, both campuses have a food pantry, a clothing closet. They both provide um, items such as diapers, hygiene items, transportation vouchers. It even extends to career support, tutoring, counseling. So it's a holistic approach that takes the entire campus to support this student. And we also provide mental health and medical support through our health centers. Now, um, even though we are, both campuses are providing a number of resources to our students, um, this the support is very limited. As I stated, we do provide emergency vouchers and emergency housing support, but those uh, only provide up to a six night stay. And it's important to note that those that need housing placement, it can take the minimum amount of time to place them into housing can take up to six months. So six days is it's just a drop in the bucket. Um, we also don't have enough caseworkers on campus to address the current needs of our students. Each of our students that we are currently addressing requires hours of attention and appointments to address their needs and to follow up to ensure that they are in the, pro in the process of being housed securely. And then our high cost and our local housing leaves our students with few viable options as well. 
And even though we have been supporting our students through federal and state aid, it's important to know that our federal aid has exhausted and our state aid is soon coming to an end. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Martha. Thank you, thank you, Susie. So as we share this, as we've uh, all shared this evening, both colleges are providing resources um, for our students who are unhoused and those who need emergency housing. However, this is not enough and uh, it's just not sufficient to meet the needs of our students. As you can see, even that uh, with all the resources we're offering, we're only able to offer limited uh, resources in terms of housing uh, for up to six nights in, in, in emergency housing. Um, so what can we do right now? Right now what we can do is uh, continue to sustain our current efforts and um, we would like the opportunity uh, to come back at a later meeting to be able to present a proposal in terms of how to further assist these students. Uh, but at this time, until our funds are exhausted, we can continue to offer what we're currently offer, uh, but we'd like to, again, present a proposal in the future. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, all of you. Appreciate it. Any questions from Trustee Trustee Melchiker? Yeah, very interesting. Um, very, very tough, uh, tough report. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned in my board report, um, uh, the Chancellor and Leticia and, and Trustee Eamon and I met with um, uh, Congressman um, Mike Levin in uh, Washington D.C. and we proposed. We asked him to stop taxing the Pell Grants so that the students would be able to use all the money for the um, for their education. Uh, the, the education money doesn't get taxed, but if the students use uh, the money for things like housing, it does get taxed. So he's carrying this legislation, legislation for us to try to not tax these, these funds so that students could use all of them for, for housing and for other needs other than their straight education. So. It's another drop in the bucket, but every every little drop helps our students. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that. Trustee Prendergast. Yeah, I have a, a couple of things. Um, so on the financial aid, uh, you kind of addressed it before. I mean, I had already decided I was going to ask a question about this. But I'm curious, when, when you get financial aid for four-year universities and they consider housing, I'm, I'm wondering if the disconnect is because the community colleges get the kind of classification as commuter colleges, that the students don't need to live on or near the campus because they can just stay with their parents, um, which we all know is not always the case. So I'm curious if there's anything we can do to advocate with financial aid to consider housing at because, I mean, room and board together, uh, I know for four years is, is way higher, but the need is the exact same. So I don't, I'm not understanding why we can't get that for our, our students and how we can lobby to Congress or, or the state or whoever when they're doing financial aid calculations for community college students that the room and board is calculated the same way as it is for four years. So that could... Potentially be one of the reasons, um, but I know that there has been lobbying uh, since I've been in the system for 20 years in the community college system. Um, then this goes back 10 years that I am aware of where we have been lobbying different organizations uh, to bring the financial aid packaging up to par to what it is for our four-year institutions. Um, other reasons for it, I'm not quite sure uh, what those would be in terms of, and it doesn't make sense as you um, explained the fact that uh, they take into consideration or, or that the uh, housing cost and room and board is taken into consideration for four-year institutions. For the most part, our community colleges have been traditionally commuter schools, but as we can see in the last several years, that has been changing tremendously. And nonetheless, it doesn't mean that a student is going to stay with their parents and not be obligated to pay for housing because there are so many reasons why that will, you know, that doesn't occur. Right. And, and I think there's a point to be made that, I mean, I know students, you know, my current students and former students that have 
read the writing on the wall and have figured out that if you really want to get into certain colleges, if you go to their sister community college, you have a better chance of getting in. So they go to Santa Barbara City College to get into UCSB. They go to Cal State LA or, or to uh, LA City College to get into UCLA, stuff like that, where they're not living there. They have traveled to go to school just like any four-year student. And I think that point may be missed by some of our lawmakers. Absolutely. So. Uh, and then the next thing was uh, when you brought up the issue with trans and non-binary students' difficulties in getting housing, it gave me the to kind of wonder, are we going to be addressing that with our housing project, that that's something that we should think about building into that process? Because that certainly sounds like if we're trying to be equitable versus... Uh, equality, that that there's going to be a higher need for that level. But if we've designed our housing to not serve that level, uh, we've done a disservice to that group. And I, I, I'm curious if we have any way of implementing, if we haven't already just figured that out. I, I know that the preliminary designs we did in our respective grant applications uh, had non-binary floors uh, with all gender restrooms. So I think we've got it covered, but it is something that we want to continue to think about as, if, if we move forward. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just add as well that the data we have, particularly when we disaggregate that, um, the information from the students who participate in these surveys, that's not me. Um, who is this? Is it? <laughs> Somebody's cell phone, yeah. Oh. I'm just full of energy tonight. Um, <laughs> that it would it would behoove us to look at the data that we have, and if the board supports moving forward with student housing at both colleges out of basic aid, we are not going to be as constrained as we would have mm, under true. the prior grant that no longer exists that does have specifications. So um, to your point, yes, we would. Um, and I would hope that we do. Trustee Inman. I have a interesting partial answer, Trustee Pendergast. When we were in Washington, D.C., we had all of these different meetings, and I'm not sure which one this was before I got this information. But they were talking about SNAP, and they have this weird thing that they do, and we tried to talk to people to stop doing this. But um, a person can be on SNAP for food stamps, et cetera. And then when that person becomes a student, they're no longer qualified for SNAP because they became a student. And you're sitting there going, why? And they say that they think the reason is that that, quali that procedure was built on a four-year model where when they became a student, they were on a food plan, a very traditional, they're all living in a dorm and they all eat there and nobody's ever changed that. So what, what is interesting is that what I found in, in advocating uh, is that a lot of people that are in the legislatures don't really understand community college very well. They know that it's there. <laughs> they drive past it. But they don't actually understand how we're different than, than the other and that our needs are different and, and many times more. So we have to continue trying to educate them all. Yeah. Trustee Day. So I wanted to, I guess, when I'm thinking about this issue, I'm thinking about where can we quickly solve issues and something, at least to me, that seems that would be a relatively easy fix. We don't need to get building permits. We don't need to be discussing plans for a building is to increase the staff to address um, the needs that aren't being met. So I was just curious, do we have a number of staff members? I'm trying to look for the specific uh, terminology here that we need so case uh, case managers, case workers. Is yeah, is there a number of staff that we are short to address the needs that we have currently? Each college does have staff and case workers, um, but as mentioned er, uh, during the presentation, 
these uh, students, uh, individual students, uh, are very different in terms of their needs, and it does take a great deal of, of hours to help one student navigate through this, all of these resources and get them connected with the appropriate community resources to be able to land in a place. And the wait time to get into long-term housing is extremely long, anywhere from six months to a year in some in some cases. But I know we've had success rates with some of our colleges and being able to place students. I know that's not answering your question in terms of the staffing, uh, but I just wanted to provide a, a, a um, an overview of what that means. And although we do have caseworkers at our colleges, we don't have enough. Do we have any sense of how many we would need to fill that gap to make sure that every student's needs are taken care of? So we would like to come back at a future meeting and present with a more thorough proposal that would have all of that information. Okay, um, and can I ask how much, it's what I'm gathering from the presentation is that the emergency housing specifically the six night stay at Airbnb and so forth. Is that simply using state funding or is there anything coming from the college's budget? No, this is, this is from the state funds that we've had. We've exhausted our HER funds and we're about to uh, conclude with our state funding. Okay, and I'm assuming, you know, probably give me the same answers before, but whatever that gap is, we'll hear about that later on. Yes. The numbers wise, okay, awesome, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes, um, I'm just wondering. Um, so the County of Orange has a you know roughly nine and ten billion dollar budget. Um, where obviously, um, they've made it's a stated priority to um, deal with the unhoused or homelessness issue. Um, so. You know, we're one of four community college districts. There's some um, 34 cities in Orange County with funding. Uh, is there, I mean, are we involved in, in those kinds of conversations at the county level, with the cities? Where do we fit into all that? Obviously, we need to do the best for our students, but there seems to be a lot of resources that are in the mix um, in terms of supporting, you know, permanent supportive housing, wraparound services. So how do we fit into all those, those conversations that are happening? Sure, I can tell you that we are currently exploring all of those options and whenever we learn and we are continually researching this in terms of um, it, whenever we learn of possible funding sources and new community organizations that are helping with this kind of work, uh, we're reaching out to, to them and making that connection so that we can be involved and not only just be involved, but uh, make ourselves available for those funds. Uh, so we are currently pursuing those efforts. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for the presentation. And uh, I guess we'll look forward to having some another specific plan in April. Right? Okay. All right. We uh, made up for not having discussion items at the last board meeting, and <laughs> we are having, uh, we're now on to 8.3. All important. I don't want to, to, you know, diminish that. Um, 8.3, so EEO plan for 2023 to 2026. Yeah, while we're transitioning, may I just uh, give the board a brief background. We have a few slides to show you. Every three years, the board needs to approve our EEO plan. It's required by Title V. Major revisions came down from Title V a year and a half ago. So all districts were delayed in getting their EEO plans revised. Our district EEO committee has been hard at work making those revisions. So uh, Director Chua chairs uh, that particular committee, and she is going to address tonight a few slides that show you what is of an import in the plan and then what your role is. Good evening, trustees, Chancellor Barnes. I'm short, like you said, guys. <laughs> now I got it. Thank you. So I'm the director of EEO Equity and Compliance Programs for the Department of HR, and I have the pleasure of presenting to you our new EEO plan for the 2023-2026 academic years. Now, throughout this presentation, I will delve into key details, uh, beginning with an overview of our Title V requirements, 
specifically discussing legislative, imp uh, legislative changes that impact our process for adoption and how we oversee the plan. Next, I will cover insights into our workforce composition data, specifically discussing the data findings across the seven EO job categories. And then I'll end with identifying our EO, EO goals derived from that data. Now, what's required under the law? So in the past, we, had, we have our EODI advisory committee. They were responsible for implementing the EO plan, but now they're also responsible for developing and revising that plan over the next three years, to cover the next three years. Uh, a major departure from past procedure is actually uh, the process for adoption. So when we have a draft EO plan, we're actually required to submit it to the state chancellor's office for feedback. And once we receive that feedback, we then have to present it to you folks, you <laughs> trustees, to consider that feedback prior to adoption. Hence why we're here today. Mm -hmm. So what was the feedback? Really it pertained to two areas, our data and our goals. So for our data in our initial draft, we didn't initially disaggregate the data across the seven EO job categories. For example, we did faculty, administrators, and classified professionals, but we didn't, for example, break it down between part-time and full-time faculty. So we remedied this, and you'll see in uh, the next slide that we then disaggregated across the seven categories. And then our goals. Our initial draft was initially, uh, I would say, overly ambitious uh, and not necessarily feasible within the next three years. That was the feedback we received. So we remedy this by prioritizing specific efforts to have a more impactful approach. So this slide is what I like to say is the creme de la creme of our EO plan. <laughs> In our past plans, we didn't actually have um, this sort of comprehensive look at our data. What you see here today is a snapshot of our active workforce. Uh, disaggregated based on the seven job categories. So as you can see from the arrow pointing up, that indicates overrepresentation. So uh, to summarize, for our faculty, as you can see for full-time and part-time, Black, Asian, Hispanic, and Latinx are underrepresented and continue to be monitored groups. Mm -hmm. For our administrators, uh, think of our educational administrators, our classified managers, our Hispanic and Latinx. Hispanic and Latinx are significantly underrepresented. And then the next four categories are actually our classified professionals, and I'll start with our service and maintenance. These are our custodians and our groundskeepers, for example. Black, Asian, and Hispanic and Latinx are underrepresented. We have our technical and paraprofessionals, for example, our IT and database administrator employees. Black, uh, Black, Asian, I'm sorry. Yeah, Black, Asian, and Hispanic Latinx folks are underrepresented. Clerical and secretarial, our black and Asians are underrepresented. And then for our skilled craft folks, skilled craft folks, that's our electricians, our plumbers, for example, uh, Asian and Hispanic and Latinx are underrepresented. Now, our EO plan has a much more comprehensive data set available to folks to view. I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that we disaggregated the data based on gender for these EO categories. Uh, briefly, I just want to discuss the data findings for each. So for our faculty and our administrators, there was actually no significant disparity between male and female representation. Unsurprisingly, there was, um, females are underrepresented for our service maintenance category and our skilled craft, and males were underrepresented for our clerical and secretarial staff. I know I went over that quickly, but I will have questions in the end if you have any. <laughs> So now what do we do with the empirical evidence that I just went over in the last slide? So we are required to ad identify specific EO goals derived from that data. And we do this, and it's included in our plan, I really wanna highlight that we do this by identifying um, specific pre-hiring, hiring and post-hiring efforts. So allow me to highlight each when it comes to our pre-hiring efforts. Uh, we have our Bloom Faculty Internship Program. That is a program that allows interns that want to be prospective faculty, they can shadow a faculty mentor in one of our colleges. This program specifically is, uh, serves as a diversity pipeline for our part-time and full-time applicant pools. 
Then for hiring, our hire, some of our hiring initiatives, we continue to implement and um, require our unconscious bias and our EEO and DEI training to anyone that wants to serve on a search committee. Uh, we, we're also planning to revise job announcements to incorporate DEIA language, right, to attract candidates that want to serve our diverse student population for our colleges. And then for our post-hiring efforts, we have multiple initiatives there as well. Uh, one major one being we want to create an accessible data warehouse for our, our, for our applicant employee data. I also want to highlight our wonderful Excel leadership program. It's, that's also new and part of our retention effort. Those are open to all active employees that want to you know, enhance their leadership skills and also incorporates a DIA curriculum. And then last but not least, we continue to address and respond to uh, discrimination complaints and EEO complaints. So to tie everything together, change in the law is good. Um, really because I, what I like to tell folks and or what I like to share with folks with respect to this EO plan is it's, it is a monumental improvement um, compared to past plans because we are much more comprehensive and transparent in terms of where we are with our data. Specifically, we are identifying areas of underrepresentation. In the past, we didn't always, we didn't include that information. And without that baseline of information, right, we don't know whether we are making progress towards diversifying our workforce. So now that we can make, uh, now that we have the data, we can make uh, data informed decisions. And that's what I mean by creating EU goals derived from our data. And we intend to measure our progress for each district goal because we do have metrics and the attention of documenting each effort. So, I also want to say this is great for us in terms of also holding the district accountable because the law does require us to annually review our plan and our EEO goals and assess whether or not our efforts have been effective. So what next? Uh, now that I've presented to you the feedback from the state chancellor's office for your consideration at an open board meeting, really, uh, it's the next step is approving it. So it will, again, as a reminder, cover 2023 to 2026 academic years. But I'm, of course, opening it up to any questions. Can I just add, we had significant data integrity issues for the last number of years. And I want to give a shout out to Denise Ensiong and I think Judy Perez is here. They have been really um, collaborators with us in trying to work with the chancellor's office. Every district has these data integrity issues, but they have been instrumental in helping us to overcome some of them and kind of reset um, how we collect data going forward. So much appreciation to the district research office for their help and support. <coughs> Thank you for that. Thank you, Anne, for your presentation. Any questions do we have on the EEO issue, plan, anything? No? I guess you're good for now until next month. <laughs> Happy to. Thank you for your good time. Good job. Thank you. All right. We are now on to our consent calendar. And do we have any polls? Oh, oh sorry. Did, was that a... Oh, I'm sorry. That was my bad. This was a, a, a item for approval, not just presentation. So we do need to approve the plan. Uh, and motion from Trustee Prendergast. Second. Second from Trustee Jay. Or, I'm sorry, Dak, my bad. Um, so, but what are we gonna be voting on then again? Next month. The plan, the plan. Well, what's that? Not, there won't be a vote next month. Okay. But yeah, once we'll you bring it back? once you vote tonight, we will proudly put the plan up on our website. Got it. So that both accrediting uh, teams can see that we are EO compliant. I see. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and vote on the item. Okay. The motion carries. Uh, uh, the consent calendar carries on a seven to zero trustee yes vote and a student trustee yes vote. Now on to ten. No, I'm sorry. 
uh, yes, 10.1, non-resident tuition fees for the academic year 2024 to 25. Need a motion for approval. Uh, so moved. Second. Motion from Trustee Milchiker. Second from Trustee Jay. Any questions? Had my question answered. Nope. Let's go ahead and vote. Okay. Motion carries. This is a dramatic vote. The motion carries on a seven to zero trustee yes vote and a student advisory yes vote. All right. So Ten point two, the Saddleback College Pass Pilot Program Amendment Number Two with the OCTA. Need a motion for approval. I so motion from uh, Trustee Inman. Second. Second from Trustee Dack. Any questions? Yeah. It, yeah. Do, do we know how many students um, take advantage of these free bus passes? Is there any data on this at all? No, but I saw, I saw 10 get off the bus just the other day. Uh, oh, that was, that, that was something. But <laughs> one, one bus, 10 got off and went to Saddleback. Okay, the, excellent. The number has not been high enough to justify the previous cost of the program, mm -hmm. so we've renegotiated. We'll, we'll be bringing you a contract for the term following this that will lower the cost by approximately 60%, and that's because we told OCTA that we were ready to quit. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. But I did count every one of them coming off the bus. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I'm glad we we're renegotiating the contract. That's really good, good percentage. Right? All right. So, um, I don't know how long how long ago it was, but I remember seeing on the bus students um, ride free. Mm -hmm. Something to the effect that it was a free ride. Th this is so. This is that program, yeah. Trustee yes. Rydell. Yeah. They, all of our students ride completely free. Yeah. with mm -hmm. their student mm -hmm. ID. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go ahead and vote. Motion carries on a seven to zero trustee yes vote and student trustee yes vote. 10.3 IVC grant acceptance innovation and, and effectiveness grant agreement with Santa Clarita Community College District. Sounds good. I move approval. Motion from trustee Melchiker. Sounds good. Second, Second from trustee Jay. Any questions? Nope. Let's go ahead and vote. Motion carries on a unanimous trustee yes vote and a student trustee yes vote. Now 10.4, Award of Master Professional Services Agreement for Task Orders for Labor Compliance Services, the Solis Group. So moved. Motion from Trustee Jay. Second. Second from Trustee Dack. Any questions? No, let's go ahead and vote. Item passes with a unanimous trustee yes vote and a student advisory yes vote. 10.5, equipment for electrical infrastructure upgrades at IVC, the award of the bid to Global Diversified Voltage Services. Motion from Trustee Rydell. Second. Second from Trustee Dack. Any questions? Okay, let's go ahead and vote. Motion carry, seven to zero, at the student trustee yes vote. Now on to human resources, 11.1, .1, academic employees and academic classified administrators, managers, personnel, actions, ratifications. Any changes to the item? No changes. No changes to the item. Is that a motion? Oh. A motion, but I have one thing to say. Also. Okay, motion from Trustee Melchiker. Second. Second from Trustee Dack. Trustee Melchiker. Well, I, I just know... Professor Hayeri already mentioned this, but I thought I'd mention once again um, some of these longtime employees that um, are retiring. Steve, uh, Stevie Daniels is retiring after about 12 years. Julie Hanks is retiring after 25 years. And Jerry Hernandez is retiring after 28 years. And Jerry Hernandez was recently honored for his 500th career win. And 500 career win is a really big deal for this kinesiology head men's basketball coach. So um, we thank them all for their many years of service. So thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Trustee Melchiker. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and vote. Uh, motion carries on a 7-0 to zero trustee yes vote and a student trustee abstention. Now on 11.2, classified personnel actions and ratifications. No changes. No changes to the item. And I just will. Do you want to move it? 
I'll move it, and I have one person to mention. Okay, motion from yeah. Trustee Melchiker. There's one classified employee. Second, Second um, from Trustee Prendergast, Trustee Melchiker. Uh, Linda Vitale, who is purchasing a contract in the district, is retiring after nine years. So we thank all of these great employees for their service. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that recognition. <laughs> Let's go ahead and vote for the item in on the item. Unanimous trustee approval and a student trustee abstention. 11.3, the annual report on first year probationary faculty recommended for continuation of tenure track status. Move approval. Motion from trustee Milchiker. Second. Second from trustee Prendergast. Any questions? No, let's go ahead and vote on the item. The motion carries on a unanimous trustee yes vote and a student trustee abstention. 11.4, report, annual report on second year probationary faculty recommended for continuation of tenure track status. Uh, move approval. Motion, Trustee Melchiker. Second. Second from Trustee Jay. Any questions, comments? Okay, let's vote on the item. Motion carries on a unanimous trustee yes vote and student trustee abstention. Now we're on to 11.5, the annual report on fourth-year probationary faculty recommended for tenure. Motion from Trustee Prendergast. Mm -hmm. Second. It's a tie. I don't know. <laughs> Trustee Rydell is closer to me. Sorry. Then, well, she one, gets the second. One, one question. And then a uh, question from Trustee Melchick. Are, are we going to celebrate these uh, faculty members that are grant, being granted tenure this year? Yay. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> so the answer to that is I'm seeing college presidents. We, we move the celebration to the end of the academic, the spring semester. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. So I'm sure I'll be notified of those celebrations. Very good. Let's vote on the item. The motion carries on a 7 to 0 trustee yes vote, student trustee abstention. Congratulations to all those who have been granted tenure. 11.6 CSEA. Chapter 586 MOU for the 410 alternative work schedule for summer of 2024. So moved. Motion from Trustee Jay. Second. Second from Trustee Dak. Seeing no questions, let's go ahead and vote. The motion, the item carries on a 7 to 0 trustee yes vote and a student trustee abstention. We're now on to agenda item 12.1, Saddleback College and Irvine Valley College, the summer 2024 continuing education or 2024 continuing education programs. Is there a motion for approval? Trustee Prendergast. Second. Second from Trustee Jay. Any questions? No. Let's go ahead and vote. Motion carries on a... 7 to 0, trustee yes vote, and a student advisory yes vote. Now on to item 13, 13.1, staff response to public comments from the previous board meeting. Do you have a comment? There's anything new? Or... The, yeah, there, there was no staff response. 13.2, uh, Saddleback College and IVC speakers. 13.3, monthly financial status report. 13.4, quarterly financial status report. 13.5, update, authorized signature list of Board of Trustees designees to approve documents and contracts. The legal fees report. The basic aid report. Retiree OPEB trust fund, 13.8. 13.9, pension stabilization trust fund. 13.10, quarterly investment report. And then 13.11, annual report on third year probationary, probationary faculty continuation of tenure track. Now we're on to the reports from the administration. And I will ask our chancellor to kick it off. All right. Thank you so much. So first, I want to uh, join everyone in acknowledging Black History Month and want to be sure to publicly thank our African-American community for their historic and continued contributions to our communities and our state and our nation. And then also happy Lunar New Year. I was able to catch the tail end of the um, celebrations at IVC and they were just lovely, so thank you so much. I had some other things to say, but I am going to wait because you have to come to the state of the district on Friday to hear me speak. But I do want to acknowledge that there's this big thing happening, it was already said, 
called accreditation. And um, I want to thank the presidents and their respective teams of faculty or classified professionals or administrators, everyone involved. It's, it, it's a lot of work, but it culminates with this particular visit. Um, based on what I've learned through the review of the ICERs and the review of the updated court inquiries and then speaking with the chair of chairs today, Francisco Rodriguez, um, it looks like we're doing pretty dang good. So we'll get the exit reports this week, but we really won't know the uh, final outcome until the commission takes action in June of this year. But thank you all. Thank our college presidents and the entire team for your good work thus far. And I will conclude there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Saddleback College President Elliot Stern. I had four announcements. I'm going to cut to two uh, so that we do not run out of time and that my uh, colleague to my right has an opportunity to speak as well. Uh, so here are the two. Uh, a year ago, I shared with you that we had, for the first time, become a majority ZTC college. Uh, this year, a year later, I sit before you and I'm proud to share with you that we are 58% of enrollments at ZTC, zero textbook costs. Big shout out and thanks to the faculty who make that possible by creating uh, resources for their students that do not cost them money. Just to give you a sense of that scale, we assume a very conservative estimate of $100 in textbook savings for a course, and that's pretty conservative. That amounts to $3.5 million per semester or $8 million per year. And to have that sort of impact, that sort of savings for students, uh, we take in, in total resident tuition, $8.5 million a year. So that to have equivalent impact to what ZTC has, we would have to be a free college. <laughs> that is the significance of zero textbook cost. It is the equivalent of all the tuition dollars that we take in. That's the savings that faculty give to our students as the gift of love uh, that keeps coming back. Next, I would like to share with you some very good news regarding our nursing program. We have been rated variously from number one to number 12 to number eight in the country, depending on what you look at. Well, the most important test is the pass rates that we have for the NCLEC exam, which tells you whether our nurses are ready to go out and practice, whether they can become registered nurse, nurses. In 2023, based on NCLEX rate, we are, our nursing program here at Saddleback College <clears throat> is number one yeah. out of 640 ADN programs across the country, and I'm not done, number one out of 13 and, I'm sorry, 1,308 nursing programs, BSN and ADN countries across the country. Saddleback Nursing is number one. Thank you. Good night. We need, we need to, we need to, um, we need to publicize that. We need to publicize that. Yeah, oh, we're going to do that. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Did you send us a report on that? So I'm, I'm sure we'll do some kind of a news release on this. Okay, yeah, very yeah. good. IVC President John Hernandez. Thank you also for the sake of time. I just want to focus on accreditation. I know there was a time when accreditation visits raised our anxiety levels and people would typically be on pins and needles. I know it is a much better ACCJC, but more importantly, I just want to commend the incredible work that has happened since summertime when the ICER was submitted and even since then, to ensure that we were making significant progress on our core inquiries, particularly the one that was a pos the one that is a possible recommendation. And I feel extremely confident that the progress that we have demonstrated, that the team will affirm and validate that. And looking forward to that uh, visit, I do want to especially thank our Vice President Miranda, who is our accreditation liaison officer for his guidance and his leadership to getting us to this point. And I also do want to also recognize um, our Director of Research Planning and Accreditation, Loris Fagioli, who truly has also um, provided incredible support. And lastly, our Employee Recognition Ceremony, where we will, among others, uh, celebrate and recognize our tenured faculty is Monday, May 6th at 3 p.m. You will receive an invitation, but you have the date tonight. Thank you. All right, thank you for that, Dr. Hernandez. and. Now we have uh, Chris McDonald, Vice Chancellor of Educational and Technology Services. I have no report. No report. Thank you. Cindy Viscachill, HR. Uh, no report. And then Anne Marie Gable, Business Services. No report. No report. Uh, that concludes our meeting. We are falling back into closed session again um, right now, but we don't have it. We will not have any report outs, so you don't need to stick around. Um, <laughs> you can if you want, but there will be nobody here. So thank you and good night. <laughs>